Thank you, everyone. So we are delighted for our closing discussion of the day, a mayor's roundtable uh, examining the 21st century business model for municipalities. Uh, we are joined today by Christy McFarland. Those of you who were with us yesterday heard Christy um, speak on the fiscal health of cities and the fiscal conditions of cities. She's the research director at the Center for City Solutions and Applied Research at the National League of Cities, where her work includes leading two annual research projects, City Fiscal Conditions and the State of Cities. Next, I'm welcoming Mayor Dan Rivera of Lawrence, Massachusetts. Since taking office, Mayor Rivera has shown a steadfast commitment to providing efficient, effective government services that have a positive impact on the people of his city. Prior to his role as mayor, Mayor Rivera served as an at-large city councilor where he was elected vice president and chaired the budget and finance committee. As a city councilor, he led the council to finding nearly a half a million dollars to fund policy positions during the financial crisis and initiate a successful campaign to cut the city council's pay during lean budget times. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Rivera. And in addition to Mayor Rivera, we're pleased to uh, invite Mayor Lisa Wong of Fitchburg to the conversation. She is serving her fourth term, having been elected mayor at the age of 28, if you can believe it. She became the first female Asian American mayor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. As mayor, she's improved the city's bond rating from a triple B minus to an A minus, consolidated 22 city departments into 10, built up a stabilization fund of $20,000 to over $4.6 million, and balanced the city's budget. Her shrewd fiscal management has led to more effective city services and more in outside investment in the city. We are honored to have her, and in addition, I should add, she is a BU graduate, having earned her undergraduate and master's degree from the university. I will turn things over to Christy, and thank you all for staying with us. Um, as we've been discussing, increasingly cities are responsible not only for basic services, but ensuring the competitive position of the United States now and into the future. It's a huge responsibility for cities and city leadership. We know cities are saddled with uh, legacy costs, deteriorating, deteriorating infrastructure, uh, state and federal funding cuts, and increasing mandates. Um, not only this, but the economy is changing drastically. Um, but unfortunately, cities by and large do not have the ability within their current fiscal structures to leverage the drivers of the local economy um, in support of their revenues. We're thinking about commuters, for example. We talked about that. New taxes, uh, where they are permitted, are not easily achieved. We've talked a lot about that. Performance management holds promise for cities. But we know there's a lot of work to do, not only to get to data-driven decision-making, but to instill a culture of data within cities. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about that today as well. So with all of these challenges, um, there are cities that are turning themselves around. It seems with all of these problems that, um, that there just aren't solutions. But I think we know at the heart of those cities that are able to turn themselves around um, is strong leadership. Um, it's something that we know intuitively, um, but fiscal leadership today is not the fiscal leadership of one year ago, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Keeping the trains moving now um, will not suffice. Uh, what we're seeing and what we've talked about over the past couple of days, um, key aspects of leadership involved creatively blending and braiding funding sources for new projects like infrastructure enabling collaboration and negotiation among really strong constituency groups within the community, nonprofits with pilot agreements, for example, unions, we heard from um, Mayor Tavares on the pension reform, um, the courage to make difficult decisions and service cuts that aren't politically favorable, um, and prioritizing city staff to adopt new technologies. We heard that in the last panel. But we know that the time is right now to re-examine the role of mayors and city leadership as not only fiscal stewards, but creators of, um, of new cities that are going to lead, um, lead the country going forward. Uh, we have two mayors with us today um, to help share their vision, um, to help share their implementation strategies, to help share um, just the leadership that it took in their communities um, to help turn their cities around. Um, so I'm excited today to have Mayor Dan Rivera and Mayor Lisa Wong. Um, and Mayor Wong, I think we'll start with you. Is that, I think that was the decision that we came to. Um, all right, take it away. 
because I have seniority, right, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so after this great conference, I feel like I should be writing a blog post entitled, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned at Boston University. <laughs> right, folks? So um, thanks to some great, great education here. Um, it's very interesting, though. I actually have a degree in international relations and uh, studied economics with a focus on Southeast Asia. So how in the world did I end up then leading a small town an hour from Boston with not actually a very large Asian population? <laughs> But I can tell you that the concepts I learned are incredibly relevant. When you're talking about the allocation of scarce resources, when you're talking about the extreme need for diplomacy when dealing with very sensitive issues, um, those are really applicable, especially when you're trying to turn things around. So I ran in 2007, and what we didn't know in 2007 was that there was going to be a big crash in 2008. Um, but in Fitchburg itself, we were dealing with some um, self-made fiscal crises. Uh, primarily, um, we were on brink of bankruptcy. We had a bond rating that had gone down dramatically. We had some department heads that were um, stealing money. Um, we didn't really have any money in the bank. Um, we had school buildings that were falling apart. It was not a really great situation. But to be honest, uh, if the city wasn't a good place, I don't think I would have run. Um, there is something about wanting to know where you're needed the most and where your skills can be applied the most that is very attractive to those who end up running for mayor. So when um, a lot of the headlines hit, um, I read one and then another and then another, and I thought, well, maybe I can convince somebody good to run for mayor. And when everyone said, why in the world would I want to take a pay cut? Why in the world would I want to work um, in that kind of environment? Then the end result was, I guess I'm going to have to do it myself. Um, so like, um, unlike most mayors, um, quit my job, took a big pay cut, and uh, sort of dove right into um, city government. And what was really great about um, running for office versus being appointed to something is you actually have to get more votes than the other people, which means um, to get more votes, I really strongly recommend talking to more people and then actually getting those votes. Um, and by doing that, you really find out um, what kind of pocketbook issues people are really concerned about and their real fears about the city. Rather than coming in and trying to be a savior, which is um, never really the right way to go, um, it's really empowering people to do what they can um, and to make sure that you're doing the right thing that is the correct strategy. So what does that mean? Um, what that mean for us in particular was people wanted to see strong leadership. It didn't mean that they wanted us to um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, try to influence or try to force people to do stuff they didn't want to do, but they wanted to see that somebody was willing to stand up, make bold decisions, and even take a lot of criticism for that. And frankly, the more criticism that I received for the decisions I made, the more popular it seemed that I had become. And trying to even teach that model at a local level was very difficult because it is, it's, it's kind of hard to make those decisions. But for um, every um, yeah, negative editorial or for people that complained, 90% um, of the folks that actually contacted me said, thank you for that bold leadership. Thank you for doing the right thing. Um, thank you for you know, standing up for us and really doing the things that people haven't been able to do for a long time. So what does that mean? And for me in particular, it meant that uh, right before my first re-election campaign, um, I reduced the library budget by 75%. I shut off 75% of the streetlights. I reduced the police and fire department by a third. So those sound pretty drastic, but crime went down. Our test scores went up. Um, dropout rate went down. Because one of the things that I have found that people have said is, I want it, I'm going to increase this, or we're going to do more of that. But then they don't talk about the actual results. So when I said that I wanted to reduce crime, it didn't necessarily mean that I was going to increase police officers. It meant that I was going to reduce crime. And we actually had the second largest reduction in crime after Newton. And you know, Mayor Seti Warren isn't here to talk about what he did, but um, we did it by using less money. What we did is we reallocated resources, and thank you to BU economics degree, but we reallocated scarce resources to where it was needed. So we reallocated funding that typically went to police, to the schools, to youth programs, wraparound services. Um, we started uh, athletic leagues for kids. We started mentorship program, coaching programs. We um, expanded after school programs to every single school. And we said, if we go to where the kids are at, and I'm talking about really small dollars, it costs us 40 grand to reinstitute free sports for three seasons for four grades. That's half a police officer. Who in the world would cut something like that that has such a major impact? After school programs, same thing. After school program at a single school, less than a single police officer. So these are obviously not the way that I put it, but uh, these are things where we all know that we needed to sort of cut things and then invest back in our 
programs, invest back in our youth, and we began to see those significant um, uh, indicators uh, go the right way. So what have we been doing since then? And this is the part about uh, fiscal leadership where you can sort of tell a good story uh, and the, you can even show good statistics. But here's the thing that I'm really worried about and I'll sort of put it out there, which is I wanna make sure that we change our statistics and there is an actual causation, which means that um, we did not alleviate poverty by kicking out the poor people. We did not reduce crime by kicking out the criminals. We actually want to make sure that we make a real difference in people's lives. So that means that we need to have good measurement. So in the last few terms, uh, we've been focusing those efforts, not just on expanding them, but also by getting some really great partnerships, whether it's the Federal Reserve or the Harvard Kennedy School Ash Center. We've had some really great resources that um, have helped us measure these things. So we actually have been able to get funding to have um, family liaisons where we literally have somebody knocking on doors in our poor census tracts to make sure that when we're counting these statistics, they have a name behind them and that we can provide them with the wraparound services they need and we can measure both the correlation and the causation. So we're really excited about these kinds of projects because it's not just a story that I want to tell in Fitchburg, but we really want to take these frameworks in a small community and make sure that we have done it right so that when we do scale it up, we can scale it up in a way that is effective and also saves money. We will turn to uh, Mayor Rivera. So you, you know that she's been at this longer because she doesn't need notes. Uh, <laughs> and I've only been doing this for a, a year and four months. And we, um, she actually came, uh, Mayor Wong came to see me when I first got elected and transitioned my transition offices. And there are uh, three things that I do all the time that I learned from that meeting. Um, so it's a really, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with her, but it's going to be sad to not be at the mayor's meetings and see her there. Of course, it also drops the total population of people of color that are mayors in Massachusetts down. Um, but I think that um, it, she really has been a mentor to me. And um, we we're talking about how young really she is, but she's really had a big impact on my administration. Um, the one thing I didn't do that she did was cut police, because we had already cut so much police. Um, but I have a really funny story to tell you about data around that. So Lawrence is a community north of Boston. It's about 77,000 people on the books. Um, with undocumented communities, probably around 80,000 people. A majority, minority community, mostly um, Hispanic, um, Dominican, Guatemalan, Puerto Rican, and um, a gateway city with all the problems that come with gateway cities, including education issues and economic development, the like. And, and people did look at me crazy when I said, we want to run for office to be the mayor of Lawrence. And I said, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that we can do. And it was driven by stuff that was happening in my, the prior administration. Um, but Again, you, enough, of, enough problems had happened that we thought that we could make a change, and we set out a campaign to change the city. Um, but we were going door to door, and of course everybody didn't want the guy who was there. That was the easy part to get convinced people to maybe not vote for the guy that was there. But what we, did, we didn't expect was when you got to the door and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, anybody but Willie. Um, and the name former mayor is Willie Lanty, and he said, yeah, anybody but Willie. And they're like, yeah, but what are you gonna do? And it took us a while to understand that that message had to be a little bit more then yeah, we're not the other guy. And we were gonna actually buy the URL, anybodybutwilly.com. Um, but we didn't because at the end of that, we really, we had to have something substantive. So we came up with our platform, which was, uh, we're gonna increase public safety, make Lawrence safer. Uh, we're gonna stand behind the turnaround plan for the schools to make Lawrence education better. And we're gonna go get jobs for people. And when you were at the door, people immediately said, yeah, I don't, I don't feel as safe as I should in my neighborhood. Um, I don't feel like my kid's getting the best education, and my and I don't have a job. My wife doesn't have a job. My husband doesn't have a job, or I, I need a better job. Um, so it's easy to connect in an environment where there was a popular city mayor, um, and despite all the accounts from outside the community, there was this popular city mayor. One of the most difficult things in American politics to do is to unsit uh, a popular mayor. And we were focused on these things that people all know that nothing was happening on, and we were able to make uh, headway. We only won by 81 votes, <laughs> so it's not like we had uh, a, a wave of support going in, but we did take more than half. And, and so when we started to build this thing afterwards, we just said, what are the things that are gonna bring the community together after this long fought campaign? And we started to build, the f number one thing was to try to bring, build trust with people. When we talk about fiscal, um, the fiscal problems that we faced, that was the number one thing going into it. I was on the city council and we had to decimate the police department, had to decimate the fire department. 
and we got taken over. Um, our school system got taken over by the by the uh, state, but we also had an overseer on the city side because um, as we were coming into office in 2009, the we had walked into a 24 million dollar fiscal um, deficit between the budget and what actually was coming in, and we we had to deficit borrow to run our operations. So in that situation, the, said, the state said, yeah, you can go borrow to run your operations every day, but we have to have an overseer. Um, some good things came from that. Um, it clearly was a black mark on the city, but at the same time, we were forced to go into GIC, which saved us a ton of money, and it, they should make that absolutely easier for people to do, um, because the, the amount of money we were doing self-financing our health care was so awful, and it created a, basically a fund that people could just um, go after every, every time they had an opportunity to. And that caused a lot of our problem. Um, but it also helped us get into a role where we were going to create certain policies and, and go in a certain direction with that money. So with the money we were collecting, focused on collecting taxes, we weren't collecting taxes as well as we could have. So it was really helpful in that process. Um, but when we were out and talking to people that we were going to borrow money to run our operations, people were like, why, why would you do that? Just stop spending. And you have to explain to people why we had to do this situation. And the, f the former administration just said, because we said so. And, but since you're, when you're elected at large and you're a city councilor, um, everybody is ar around you. They stop you just as much as the mayor. But you have to uh, rely on every community. You can't just rely on certain groups of people. You have to do, get votes from everywhere in the city. So I would go around with my spreadsheet about how we were going to spend every dollar. Um, and I think people felt like, at least he's talking to us. And we brought that into our, into our administration now. We said, listen, we, we know that we, we are going to have to cut positions. We're going to try to add police officers. Um, but we're going to do it um, in a way that's responsible. But you're going to have to trust us on some of these things. And that has helped us financially um, set a, a, a culture in the hall and with the community in a way that um, has been helpful in these times where we have such little, such little, such little money. Um, but part of that is also building value in it. So, the, the police department thing is we, we did add 10 net new police officers, which really was about 15 new police officers. Um, we focused on getting some diverse population into the police department, as you can see, as we saw from today. And you don't have to go as far as Baltimore. Um, in Brockton, they just had some issues and stuff that's happened in Boston. We d need to have to focus on diversifying our police force. And so we did some of that. But at the same time, people wanted us to keep overtime down. That was the one thing that was really bothering people. We spent so much money on overtime. So we did an analysis of six months, what happens between 7 o'clock in the morning and 11 o'clock in the morning um, over six months, how many calls and how many incidences. So on average, a day between those hours, there are 18 calls and one incidence between 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. So I said, hey, we're going to have walking patrols during that time. The chief's like, sure, we'll just use overtime. And I said, no, you don't understand what I'm saying to you. The data shows that you guys aren't doing anything between 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. And I want the guys parking their cars, and I want them walking. And I specifically want them walking in these couple areas. Um, and you would have think that, like, first of all, I was forcing them to do something crazy. Um, but once they got on board, the love they were getting from the neighborhood, the love they were getting from the, the store owners um, was like, they love to do it now. The police officers love to be out of their vehicles and love walking on the patrol because they get a new level of recognition. It kind of had to be re jiggered after the snow that we got because it stopped after the snow. They weren't, in, they weren't out there doing it in the snow. Um, but it's things like that that we're doing that the hall has been never really challenged to do. I got a lot of crazy attention for making people wear ties um, and making them park far away from the, the, the hall so that people who come to get business at the hall. Um, and what I said in my, my most recent State of the City address was that this isn't really isn't about wearing a tie, coming well dressed to this. This is about setting an example to people that give you money every month, every quarter to pay their tax bills. When they come and they deal with city government, A, we can trust you, because look what they're doing with the dollars that we're giving them. But B, that they take the work serious enough that they're gonna look the part and they're gonna get, make it easier for me to come and interact with them. And you know, it's been working so far, we still have some time to go. We have you know, almost two thirds of a, um, of a term to go, but we feel like this is, has changed this culture. The leadership that we've brought is this, hey, we're going to do stuff that matters to people every day, and we're going to be professional when we do it. Great. Thank you, and, and thanks to you both. 
Um, you just talked a lot about um, culture and, and the culture change that, um, that you need to deal with when you came in um, to office. Um, Mayor Wong, maybe you can talk a little bit about that as well in terms of what, what you faced um, internally um, in, in your city government as well. Uh, long before I was mayor, I was uh, uh, executive director of the Redevelopment Authority. And um, so about a decade and a half ago, we were able to um, uh, build a park downtown right by the river to um, attract private investment. And it was a, a site that um, had uh, made rubber pellets and there was a fire. So it actually like created a whole black smoke around the downtown for a couple days. So that was the perfect site for us to buy it, clean it up and turn it into a park. During that time, I didn't work for the city, I worked for an independent agency. And um, you know, when we built a park, uh, we were able to get some grants. And I remember we had a newspaper headline that said, you know, Lisa Wong at Redevelopment Authority gets half a million dollar grant to build park downtown. And then the other headline was, uh, mayor of that time has to lay off 10 firefighters. So there was this idea that we were taking money from the firefighters and using it to build parks. Um, that park, I was, I was so happy to have built because the city was supposed to build in the 70s before I was born but never did because the city said, we're not gonna build parks if we don't know how to maintain them. So because I didn't work for the city, I said, I'll build the park, I'll start a nonprofit, we'll fundraise, we'll maintain it, we'll program it and everything. And that was the only way that we could build a park. But at the same time, there was still the stigma that we were taking money away from police and fire, you know, sort of the, the sacred cows. 10 years later, I'm mayor. And uh, one of the platforms I had run on was land conservation, um, revitalizing the river, um, something I care very deeply about. So we were on our way to building our second riverfront park less than a mile away, and we're going to create sort of an emerald necklace in the city. Um, so I'm mayor now. We get a million dollars to build that next park. Headlines at the same time, Mayor Wong is reducing police and fire by a third. This time, I'm actually responsible for both, even though they're <laughs> not interrelated. So, but during that time, the idea about building these jewels downtown, about taking sites that have been blighted for like 30, 40, 50, 60 years was so that people could visually see a difference in their community. Um, so what happened during that time is, I, again, I was shutting off street lights and, I, and it, was, it was very unpopular. People could see that I wasn't doing these, these things because I wanted to, I was doing these things because we needed to. Um, and that just because we we're um, sacrificing in certain areas, it didn't mean that we shouldn't take advantage of opportunities like getting money to build parks. That particular park that we built for a million dollars leveraged a private investment for $18 million right across the river, a completely private investment. One of the first 100% market rate investments we had at the height of the economic downturn, which created comps and therefore created another $50 million in, in additional private investment. So, you know, there's a big return on that. But how do you get the community to kind of believe in that when, you know, for 40, 50 years, they didn't want to build parks because they didn't know how to empty out the trash. So in this case, um, I was really wary about it. I was like, this is going to be terrible. Um, but the culture had shifted, the culture had begun to change. And the way that um, I did a lot of my changes is I worked with the unions on a lot of it. And uh, we also sort of rooted out a lot of uh, civil rights or corruption issues. So, um, you know, it wasn't doing it willy-nilly, I wasn't doing it for political reasons. So the response, even after reducing police and fire by, by so much was the firefighter responded by saying, Mayor Wong, we understand what you're doing, so this is what we're gonna do. Um, we know you're building a park, but we also know that you don't have money to program it. We will program the parks. So the firefighters offered to voluntarily program the parks instead of saying the parks took away money from us. The firefighters also uh, figured out a way in order to work shifts so they could um, sort of work time without having to get it paid. Um, they also led a effort on uh, reducing healthcare costs. So we created a plan design program which has resulted in a two and a half million dollar annual operating savings and a $50 million reduction in our overall OPEB pension costs in the long run, right? Think about that. So, you know, usually that's not the response when you say you're cutting them. The police department responded by saying that they wanted to create a police athletic league so that we could provide sports for the kids, um, especially after schools, weekends, and during the summer. They responded by creating a junior academy so that they could create a pipeline of students to the police, not to prison. And a lot of them have decided that they want to join different boards and commissions, like the Housing Authority. So that just, that's just sort of speaking about the culture change and how even when you're reducing significant amounts of their staff, people still want to be involved. So what's the difference there? 
It's if you treat people like human beings and you bring them around the table, you can actually find these mutual solutions. The, the, the teachers did the same thing. Um, even our managers, our IT guys, our planners, you know what they did? So they said, you know what? We want to have something good in the city. So what, what can we add? They're like, we really like drinking beer. So every day after work, we go to the local bar or we go to like different bars and we sort of like, you know, convinced about the city. But why don't we turn this into an event? So they created something called the Brewers Festival. And it rakes in fifteen to twenty thousand dollars every year, and it brings in people from all over New England. And they donate the money to the senior center and the library, which are two areas that we've had to make some cuts. I mean, it's really amazing to see people come forward. We've had, and there's also a lot of examples about the community, private citizens who have come forward. I mean, the most amazing initiatives we have, and I'm talking about everything from cleaning up the city, which you can see to people who are combating sexual violence against kids. It is amazing the kinds of things that people have decided to come forward that don't cost any money, and in fact, a lot of times have significant savings. Amazing. Um, before we turn it over to the audience, I just wanted to, um, to ask a question of uh, Mayor and CEO, Dan Rivera, if some of you can see his name. Oh, let me just take I took it off. off, sorry. All right, um, so your name tag does say mayor and CEO, which I think is relatively unique. Um, just want you to maybe tell us what that indicates about your either vision for the city or your leadership style, um, particularly in the finance realm. Well, I think that part of it was I went to a mayor's conference and I saw another mayor had it and I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> So uh, like I, whoever had the stats about who you look to for information, it was at a mayor's conference and I was a, a bigger aspi aspirational mayor that I, I got it from. But, you know, it's a flourish really because in, in the reality, the, the title is mayor and anything I sign has to have mayor on it, not CEO. But it was just a message that we were going to do things differently, that, um, that because we are in the private sector, in the public sector, doesn't mean we can't take ourselves seriously, and that we can't force other people to take us seriously. So this, this just happened um, maybe a month and a half ago. We are changing over our, um, our payroll systems. The city and the schools had two different ones. Um, the, city, the schools is like $4.5 million payroll. Um, it was being done by a small mom and pop outfit in, in, you know, out on Cape Ann, and we, we were using a large firm for ours. Ours is probably pro comparable. And so, we decided we put them together, so we're doing this thing, and in the, tra in the transitioning it over, there was a month that we were going to have overlap. So in that last week, the mom and pop store said, "You owe us ten thousand dollars. We're going to hold hostage four point five million dollar payroll for Monday." So I get this crazy call. People are like, "Oh, we're going to use free cash. How are we going to soft this thing?" And I was like, "Did we just get threatened by like some guy in a house in Beverly?" I said, I want the full weight and force of the city of Lawrence, however big that may be. Uh, I want him to feel afraid to have done that because we are a serious operation. We have, we have teachers that are going to go without paychecks. That's just not acceptable. And I want the guy to know that that's not serious. And that goes to the same sense with um, receivership programs, dealing with, with developers, that we're a serious player. And, and people are like, hey, can you just give this thing away? We're running a venture here that's called government for everyone. And if we give everything away, by the way, then we'll have anything for no one. So that part of it is what I bring in. Having sat on the city council's budget and finance committee, I take it really serious because I remember when we didn't have anything. So now that we have some money, um, it's really, and it also helps with the staff. Like, hey, we are a business. Take yourself seriously. Um, we, don't, we don't eat in meetings. Everybody used to come in eating and talking. And they were like, we don't eat in meetings. This is a serious business. We wouldn't, I never eat in any of the, the for-profit organizations I work for at meetings because I usually get stuff on myself. Um, but more importantly, it's like somebody just turns to you and you you have your mouth full of food. Um, but, but more, it's just like this idea that we are going to take ourselves seriously and everybody else has to, too. All right, so at this point, we're going to open it up. I know it's been a long few days. Let's see if you have any. Great, here we go. Yeah, no, I'm not from, I'm from Michigan originally. I'm not from Massachusetts. I'm not from Massachusetts's third congressional district, but I just have to say, Mayor Wong, I know Nikki Songus is in office now, but <laughs> I really urge you to run in the future. I mean, don't we need more people, for all the Americans in the room, don't we need women like this in Congress with her conviction, talking about local government issues with a strong voice, and both these folks, we need more people like this in Congress, and I live in Washington, D.C., and it is imperative that we have more strong advocates of issues like this in Washington. 
Thank you. And for the record, Nikki Songas, I'm not running against you. I'm, not, I'm actually moving out of your congressional district. So. <laughs> well, I hope you'll consider running wherever, uh, to wherever you choose to move in the future. Thank you. But uh, can I just say this is a thing I think that is happening in her city and we're trying to do in our city is that, that this idea that um, there is a strong voice and people are like, well, you know, every time election time comes, elected officials give away the store and the collective bargaining agreements. And any serious mayor that wants to have a good impact, that's the last thing you want to do. And if you can't get elected without selling the store on, in the like, collective bargaining agreements, not that it matters in our communities, a lot of the, the organized laborers have left the urban centers in a real way. Um, but, you know, it's th having that, that strength, and uh, again, like I've learned a ton from her, is, is important because then people are like, you got to be careful when you go to Fitchburg because Lisa wants mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mayor Wong, your uh, unions and residents and businesses all sounds like it relatively quickly developed an extraordinary sense of enlightenment and engagement. Was there a particular union or another group that sort of, uh, I don't want to say fell, fell into line because it's more, high, in, more spirited than that, but was there a particular union or group that sort of came around to this enlightened idea of really engaging with you? And was that group and their response a catalyst for what happened, it seems like, in an extraordinary way? Yeah. It started off at um, a debate where I was asked if the mayor should have anything to do with the schools. Uh, the mayor in my city is chair of the school committee, and we we're told that it was a waste of time, that maybe the, we should change the charter. And I thought, why are we having this conversation? The schools are the most important part of the city. Um, this is probably a root of an issue. So during the campaign, um, volunteers who went door to door with me decided, sometimes on the spot, like I would be, hi, I'm Mayor Wong, I'm running, I'm Lisa Wong, I'm running for mayor. And they would say, hi, I'm Sally, I'm running for school committee. I'm like, you are? <laughs> So people who started volunteering started jumping on the school committee bandwagon. And a lot of mayors will say, you got to run a slate of people on the city council. I have never run anybody for city council. I've never had support from the city council. I've never had trouble getting anything passed. But I finally have a school committee in which everyone on school committee wants to be on school committee. Our kids today mm. are poorer than when I started eight years ago, significantly poor. But their test scores are up. Um, youth crime rate is almost down to, to virtually nothing. Um, graduation rates are up. Um, there, we have social and emotional wellness programs. We had one of the largest drops in child obesity rates in the country. Just because we have a school committee that's completely engaged. We have school committee members who are there um, because they have a background in PR. Maybe they were a reporter. The reporter that used to cover us is now on the school committee. <laughs> Right? We like to bring people into our bandwagon. So he changed the dynamic from having negative press all the time to having positive press almost every day about the school. Uh, we have other school committee members who are, um, their, their background is in public safety, others who um, as background in jobs development. Right, So everyone is bringing their full self to that. So I think the, the idea that the school committee came together, and, and so it's not just the mayor, but a body of leadership came together visibly it sent the invitation to kids, teachers, parents, people who aren't typically engaged, you know, not the usual suspects, but are the majority of people in the community to also get engaged. People really want to have pride in their city. Even though we all like to complain, don't you really deeply want to have pride in your city? Don't you want to feel like you're useful, like there's something that you can provide? So our role was really to create that invitation. So it doesn't matter what you want. I mean, we had people that wanted to change traffic plans around the school, that's fine. You know, people who just wanted to donate mulch every year, that's fine. We created a whole system in which people could get engaged. We created a system of uh, people who volunteer to teach kids how to take care of animals because it's the only way that we can teach kids about domestic violence. We can't say, we're gonna teach your kids about domestic violence because a lot of these kids are in in terrible homes, but we can teach them about how to care for animals and people will volunteer. And because of that, the reporting has gone up and we've helped save a lot of our kids. Like those are the kinds of things that happen. They don't cost anything. They really change the culture. Um, we, we have a movie being filmed in Fitchburg right now because of some of the work that we're doing in the schools. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's my short answer to say that, that um, I think if you have a community that has a strong body of leadership, and it doesn't just have to be the mayor, it can be a school committee, it could be a city council, it could be 
you know, the parks board, something like that, that becomes a rallying point for people to get engaged, you're going to see just the most amazing things happen. That, you can't, I don't think you can understate that piece of the, the community coming together. One of the things that I did, and it was really um, kind of a thing that I was just joking at when I'd go to try to get votes, I told people we're going to bring back the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And everybody loved it. Now, here's a Puerto Rican Dominican kid going around telling people that I'm going to bring back the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And it was kind of weird. And, but it, the St. Patrick's Day Parade has been something that had been going on forever. And, and what we realized after we did the first year was it's the biggest St. Patrick's Day Parade north of Boston, from Newburyport to, I don't know, to probably to Canada. To, to Canada. <laughs> um, but we, no one else had, does one. That's the other thing. No one does one. We're the only one that does one. Um, so we're the biggest. But it had, it had brought up, because we were a center pole city, as you can imagine, back, in the, back when we were first founded, we were in the industrial center, and everything else was farmed. So people, when they were going to town, they weren't going downtown North Andover. They didn't exist. They were going to Lawrence. The same thing, they would come as far away from Haverhill. So we had always had this thing that people would come to our community for this thing. So we brought it back, and in the first couple meetings, and I didn't really have anything to bring it back except to hold three meetings. And the first meeting, I was like, no, we can't do it. We don't have the list, we don't have the money. The second thing was, hey, uh, all right, we're gonna do it, but we think we have to do a nonprofit thing. And a non so there's somebody who was a lawyer in the group sent this really crazy email how, how expensive it is to become a nonprofit. And I was like, listen, if I have to be the only one with an Irish flag on Essex Street, we're gonna have this parade. And every moment, the third one, they were like, okay, I think we can do it. We had more parade than route. I was stopping off, I was in the front, then, we, then people were still getting on the parade route. Yeah, then Lisa came, you've come to both. I, just, yeah, what he's not mentioning is that he stole my husband's tie during the parade, too. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a thing that I've got. Everybody no. wants to give me their tie. Um, I like your tie. Here, have it. <laughs> like you, you have a lot of power as mayor. You got to be careful with it. <laughs> beer, beer may have something to do with that. Um, but, but at the end of the that we as a community and having the schools involved in that was it big. Like the schools, all those teachers. So you have all these little brown kids in all this Irish get up. Because it, so it wasn't really about the celebration of the Irish tradition, which there is a very serious tradition in our city. Um, but it was about bringing the community around something that everybody could do and be proud of. Um, and, and even the firefighters who I constantly am, am battling with, they're really excited to be in their blues with their silver gear on and, and being out there with their green gloves and the police officers too. And state police come with their, with their horses and all the kids are like talking about it. And it's really just a parade. And Emily, I was on Emily Rooney early on in, the, in my um, being mayor. And she's like, you think you can bring a city back by smiling more and having parades? I'm like, I'm sure going to try. It's a lot worse than frowning and telling everybody, no, you can have a parade. I don't think you touched on this, but forgive me if you did, because I had to jump out for a moment. I'm curious, uh, you know, Mayor Wong, obviously you've been in office for a number of years, and Mayor Rivera, um, you've no doubt learned a lot, even in your short time so far. And if you had to look back on the first day that you took office, what advice would you have given yourself or what do you wish you knew then, particularly around this notion of fiscal leadership and, and how to be a responsible fiscal steward and put your city on a path where, um, you know, Mayor Menino governed for 20 years. So the decisions he made when he first took office are the ones he had to live with, Boston had to live with, and he had to live with for two decades. And so you need not answer this, you know, as if you were in office for two decades, but, you know, what, what do you wish you had known then that um, would put your city onto a, a prosperous future? Uh, there's a Chinese proverb that says that if you run up the stairs too fast, you find yourself on the top landing alone. Um, so, I, I mean, I just told you about a few things that, that I did. This is probably only a fraction of what I tried to do. Um, I tried to fix everything at once. <laughs> and, uh, and, and a lot of things people bought into, but there was a lot of things where I found myself standing alone. And when you do that, sometimes it actually then takes longer because now you've got to go back down the stairs. Um, you have to sort of rebuild trust and legitimacy into it and then kind of walk your way back up. So, um, and then sometimes when you're really successful, you kind of think, oh, you know, you're, the next one's going to come in. What's interesting now is that there's a whole group of folks that are, um, that are now engaged and they assume that the pace of change is going to be as quick as it was before. Anybody gain a lot of weight and try to lose it? you like lose those first 10 pounds really quickly and those last 10 pounds like take forever or never come off. I kind of feel like we're in that mode right now. <laughs> so we're trying to figure out um, how do we change the model now? So now that we have people engaged, we have enthusiasm, what does that new model look like? How do you move from crisis to calm? Um, how do you go from 
um, you know, everything is burning and we need to put the fire out to how do we now build stuff? So we've built strong foundations. And this next step, um, you know, I'll say, you know, unfortunately, I'm, uh, I'm moving. I got married and I'm moving to another city similar to Fitchburg, so I'm not going to be there. But um, so certainly since when I was at the Redevelopment Authority to mayor, um, there are projects where I started the permitting process at the Redevelopment Authority and then was finally able to get awarded the permits when I was mayor about 10 years later. So, you know, we always have that mindset that sometimes these things take a long time. Um, but, you know, sometimes when you finally get in power, you kind of think, oh, I can suddenly do all of these things. So that's, that's what I've told my slightly younger self to just sort of maybe, um, you know, calm down a little bit. <laughs> so I'm going to show my, uh, my youngerness in this job because uh, what I would say is I would do more earlier. Uh, <laughs> We need to hang out more. Oh, I know. <laughs> Everyone's like, I don't understand what's going on here. We need to hang out more. Um, I hate that 100 day thing. It's the stupidest thing on the planet. Everyone's like, what did you do the first 100 days? Uh, and, and I apologize to John F. Kennedy, which is probably the person who started with this first 100 day thing. But um, it really is a, a bad mo thing to like to gauge people. Marty Wash did like 100 videos, a video every day. Um, but it just felt like awkward and, and weird. But then we were um, recently, we have a, a, an item before the city council um, that we're going to borrow $8 million to redo a building down, down, downtown. And it's kind of a big deal, um, totally financed by Lawrence, totally done um, with the support of mass development in a, in a way that a deal any, you know, four times the size happens in Boston almost every day. Um, but it's going to be, for us, a real um, indicator that we we're, we're interested in doing big things in the city. We did that in the first, we started that conversation the first 100 days, and we just keep looking at it, but can't believe we're still talking about this thing. Um, and, you know, there's a, there wasn't a, a lot of people trying to stop us from doing some of those things. And that first 100 days, um, we got a, a downtown bus route done, all this stuff that's really, at the, at now that we can look back and say have a larger impact <clears throat> on stuff. Um, so I would have probably been more f forceful in that first 100 days, and I definitely would have hired a lawyer. We just have ever been sued more than I can ever imagine in my life. It's crazy. Because everybody thinks they can just sue the city and you know and when you're in a city as small as ours, it's just you're the target. So <laughs> I could just say so the first the first six months I took office, I, I didn't follow that hundred day thing. Because I what I followed is I said I had I'm gonna have six months of a honeymoon period in which anything I do, no one's really gonna care. So what I decided to do was I decided to get a bunch of lawyers and spend the time doing things that no one really noticed, which is um, so we actually went through the charter and said, how much can I change the charter so that I can make the city much more efficient, like consolidating the departments and also consolidate power underneath the mayor's office where I need it to, even if I don't need to do it now. So we passed sweeping legislation that no one read and no one understood in my first six months. But it's helped me for the next eight years in office. Unfortunately, now everyone's catching on and they're kind of undoing it. And I said, that's, I'm like, but I'm leaving office. You're going to screw the next guy. He's now going to have to have 22 department heads reporting to him versus having 10, you know, chief executives who are held accountable to goals. But, you know, that's my, that's my next fight for the eight, eight months is try to make it easier for the next guy to come on board. I, I would just like to, uh, to make a comment. Uh, I've enjoyed today in terms of uh, a focus on data, a focus on analysis, a focus on quantitative methods and the like, but um, in the spirit of someone who grew up in the Kennedy years, um, there's a reason that the book that he wrote was called Profiles in Courage and not Profiles in Data. Hmm. Um, and I think that both of you having known Lisa, you the longest, but both of you represent something that we haven't talked a lot about today, and that is sort of a type of courage, a type of imagination, and a type of intelligence, and, and, and real commitment uh, to what you're doing with no ulterior motives. And I, I, I think that we can't overlook that as hard as that is to quantify and the like, but that type of, of, uh, of courage uh, and commitment is really got to be a part of this formula of looking at efficiency and effectiveness and the like, all of which are important, and analysis, all of which are important. But I think without what, what both of you represent in terms of, of intelligence, creativity, and courage, we just don't get there. And um, that's my 
with my white hair now and all of this. That's my comments on the on the day. I, I like to hide that this idea that you're talking about in saying just we're just gonna have an adult conversation and let's all talk about what we're doing. And I don't think so much it's just courage. I think and people find it refreshing, like just hey, this is really what's on the table. And pushing back the bullies in this discussion is really important. Um, everybody's like, oh yeah, it's just more government spending. No, it's actually not what you're saying. It's this other thing. And one of the things that we do is we, we just then juxtapose the person saying those things and say, would you trust the person, that person who just said that with the keys to your car? You probably wouldn't even trust them with the keys to your car, never mind your kid. But he's making a judgment, make, say, making a statement about something that's going to affect your property value, something that affects your kid's education. And, and that changes the conversation real quick for people. You say, hey, listen, we're having an adult conversation. We're not just being crazy about that. Um, and especially it's easy to do that when you leave a job and get a pay cut to do it. And that's what I did just similar to Lisa. Um, when you do make those sacrifices, it's just easier to be candid with people. And I just maybe an underlying thread that I want to point out is I think a lot of us have come to office because we have experienced both some sort of great adversity and also realize that we have great opportunity. Um, I have to say it is so much easier to run for office than it is to be in office. When you run for office, you can pick and choose your voters. Um, you can go sort of outside of the mainstream. When you're in office, you often cannot pick who's in the room. And the, you know, this is sort of for a later time and probably indicative of me leaving office, but I cannot tell you the amount of discrimination, sexism that I have experienced, how hard it is in those spaces. What has saved me in the past eight years has, um, I've gotten steady, um, Dan, more and more people, more Asian people, more young people, more women, more diversity, more voices have been joining the fold. This is incredibly powerful. I've also found, because I have friends in every sector, this is happening in just about every sector of leadership, law, finance, you name it. But it doesn't get talked about the way that we can. So one of the greatest gifts that I found is that the more discrimination that I get, the more I realize that I have discrimination against me, but I also have opportunity. How many people in my city have discrimination without opportunity? It is my job to create those opportunities. So I know that we funnel the stuff that we get, the adversity that we get, into helping more and more people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's kind of that, that courage that you'll see, not just in us, but the people that we represent. Because we don't, it's easier for us to come here. We get invited to these spaces. We tell stories for people who can't tell their own story. Mm -hmm. it is, we could sit here all evening telling you stories about pro, real profiles and courage in our community. question of Mayor Rivera just a little specifically about um, you know you talk about courage to talk about these issues can you talk a little tactically about how you moved the public conversation in Lawrence from uh, anybody but Willie to an actual agenda that you are still I think crafting for the city um, and and how you how you brought people to uh, a new content agenda for the city um, like a lot of great things didn't really happen purposefully. Um, we kind of fell into it. We had um, our, our tagline was make Lawrence better. Um, so it's easy to say, hey, we're just gonna try to make this thing better. The metrics people in the room are cringing because they didn't say we're not gonna make it 10% better or 50%. We're just gonna make it better than it is. And that got a lot of people on board. Um, but, you know, everybody was kind of tired talking about that other thing and him. And so it was easier to get people to turn the page on it. Um, and getting us out of the way. And when you say to somebody, hey, I'm not gonna really try to drive the parks agenda because I don't wanna be the parks mayor, but Groundwork Lawrence is doing a great job, we're gonna empower that. Uh, we're, I'm not gonna be the housing mayor, I'm not, you know, if anything, I'm a marketing major from my, my MBA, I wanna really be, spend more time in economic development. So we're gonna empower the CDCs and the housing developers in the community to do what we need to, to, get, to do it um, and guide folks in the direction that I think is impor important. Um, but not making it about me has been helpful. And I know it's saying that sounds self, like it's, a, it's weird for me to say I'm not making it about me. Um, but it, it does help when you get yourself out of the way and people get a, a conversation around the table. We have an arts conversation going for the first time in a very long time. That's the other thing. Everybody thinks we're doing things for the first time. And I keep telling people, we were founded 18 something. And let me tell you, I'm pretty sure this isn't the first time people are talking about arts in our community. So let's get back down to earth and have a conversation about what we're going to do. And so this, that whole thing about, it's not really about me, and it's not really about being the, the ultimate, this 
my predecessor, predecessor used to always say, no matter where he was, it was the great city of Lawrence. And I don't like calling myself great. I want other people to th think that we're great, so we don't use that terminology. So again, making it like this thing about what we're all doing together has helped. Um, and he, you know, people were anxious to get that stuff. And we talk about it as, you know, raise, relief, lifting the cloud of the, a lot of stuff that was already happening. All these organizations were there. We had a, a cleanup that had 2,000 people come out to uh, clean a 6.7 square mile city. And they had been doing that for like eight years. But now every time we do it, we get a lot of press in the glow, we get press in, in the, the local paper, everybody wants to come out to it. And again, it's just showing people that, that if the public sphere gets out of the way, we could really get some of this stuff done. It may be unfair for me to ask this question because I know it's hard to predict, but I just want to know from your perspective, uh, how does the city of the future looks like in terms of size, population, services provided, and governing structure? Let's speak 50 years from now. I guess I'll just speak about some recent uh, uh, infrastructure and economic development that's going on that uh, is making me think of that very thing. Um, I've been working with two manufacturers this week who are expanding, but they're expanding without jobs. So they need more square footage in the city. They need to expand. Um, and the millions of dollars that they're investing is going to go primarily into automation, into machines. Um, I'm also working with a number of people who are trying to, trying to get the skill sets and trying to start um, either incubator spaces or to get more cafes downtown because the bulk of their work is done on their computer. Uh, my neighbor, I mean, if I look out my back porch and I can see his back porch, you know, he's a chief technology officer for um, a company in Colorado, does everything from his back porch. And, um, you know, we interact because he, you know, likes to throw the neighborhood New Year's party. So um, it's, it's an interesting environment in which um, increasingly the people with the most wealth are the ones that are not necessarily investing that wealth back in terms of job creation or in terms of building infrastructure. Um, but yet they're making a living for themselves. That also creates a big skills gap. So trying to figure out what kinds of things are we going to do. So in the last um, you know, decade or so, a lot of the economic development tax incentive programs have gone to build businesses where Fitchburg gives up real estate taxes, but the jobs go to a majority of people in the surrounding communities who have the master's degrees, who have the PhDs. So more recently, we've been trying to figure out um, what is our role? You know, what is the role of a small city of 40,000? Um, and part of the role is to lift people out of poverty. So we've been targeting changing and adding industries that are focused on the things where people can work locally, have flexible jobs, and also be able to make a good income where they can actually afford to live in the community. The problem is that the surrounding communities are not doing the same thing. So they're building more housing on land that could be used for jobs, and they're not having those same kinds of conversations. Um, but we brought in, um, uh, organization called Great Wolf, which spent $100 million investing in a water park that's, that's uh, year round. So that's 500 new jobs. And we're focusing our transportation, our bus systems on getting people, especially single moms, from the neighborhoods and city to um, that particular facility right down the road. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to focus on a very micro scale, but at the same time, it's harder to measure. So the work that we're trying to do is how do we measure those kinds of things? Because as a former economic development official, a redevelopment authority person, a person who's now mayor, those are not the ways in which we measure things. So therefore, most of the resources are being allocated in a way that doesn't take that into consideration. It just sort of moves things around. So if there's something that I do after a mayor, it's going to be really looking at data, looking at true anti-poverty measures, and trying to figure out how to shift the conversation so that it's not about nonprofits and not about subsidy, but it's about making the market work efficiently and effectively so that we can lift all people out of poverty. We can deal with um, the achievement gap. We can deal with the income gap. We can deal with all sorts of those things. So, you know, a, a city of the future, I'm hoping, is going to be one that uses that data, but uses in a way to have real conversations about nuanced things that they're going to do so that you're not going to have all these major cities trying to compete for the same Fortune 500 companies. That is one of the things that I always talk about that she taught me really early on, and that's that you know if you let the surrounding communities in your in your area uh, make housing of all the industrial space, then your people won't have anywhere to go to work, and that's really the case in Lawrence. A lot of people that work and live in Lawrence work in Methuen, Andover, North Andover, Haverhill, Farway is Newburyport, um, you know Gloucester, Reading, 
they're going far to work, Burlington, uh, because we don't have those jobs here. And, and we did have, in um, Barry Bluestone did a report that we did have job growth in certain sectors, and it was mostly people coming from outside the community to work. Um, so I worry about the future of cities, mostly because there is this push to go back to the, uh, back to the urban core. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call it gentrification, but the idea that what we have in the urban core can't work, so we have to figure out how to grow housing for outside folks or, um, you know, do away with um, some of the industrial and commercial space because we can't bring those things back to life. Um, but we think that, you know, this again happened by chance. We want to make Lawrence a place uh, where people work. And work has been a really important part of why Lawrence was established. Our seal has two workers on it and a, and a, and a dam that was built to run the mills. Uh, has a worker bee on it, says industry on it. Work is really what Lawrence has always been about. And so we, we think that in the future, Lawrence will be a place that can capture some of that onshoring that's happening. Um, the manufacturer is going to look different, like Lisa talked about. Um, but at the same time, it's places that have the infrastructure to capture some of that. What worries me the most is that people want to change the fundamental way we have government. Um, and the other day, I heard something of like the non privatization of the public space. And that scares me to no end because you know, American democracy has worked for a very long time and we elect city councilors and we elect, and we have problems, trust me, we, we definitely, we see it every day. But community, poor communities can't have that very basic right, that very basic concept that we're gonna go out and vote for somebody to do a job for us, however poorly they end up doing that job, um, taken away and done, you know, by uh, boards and, and commissions that are not locally controlled. And we're seeing that. With our school systems, we, our school was put into to, um, state receivership, but um, that scares me about the cities of the future that we want. We're gonna it, in the rush up for globalization that, and everybody just can get on a, a computer and do, and be with everyone else in the world, that that local democracy dies. Sorry for the downer. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to introduce another downer, uh, but let me preface my comments by saying um, your ideas, your enthusiasm, it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's contagious. I think everybody in the room is really excited by what you're both saying. Um, I, I'm interested um, in, in the three-letter word, tax. Um, we've talked a lot about taxation over the last couple of days, and yet both of you, when you talked about what you're doing in your cities, uh, haven't mentioned uh, taxation at all. Um, maybe that's a good thing, uh, but my question is, where does taxation fit into what you're doing? Uh, has it been an issue? Uh, did you run to reduce taxes, to raise taxes? Can you raise taxes? How do you think services should be funded? I'd, I'd just a little, be appreciate a little of your perspective on, on taxation. I actually did run, said I was going to raise taxes. Um, so the last year, we didn't raise it to 2.5%, which is what you can do in Massachusetts. Um, but I have to start by saying that I, I'm a poster child for government. I'm a public school kid. I lived in the public housing project. Um, I was a benefactor of um, Pelt Grants, um, the GI Bill, and the GI Home Loan. Um, worked in a public housing project. Uh, worked for government. I did go into the private sector after I got my MBA. Um, but so I, have, I feel like this urge to make sure that those things are there for everybody else. And that stuff costs money. Good teachers cost money. Um, and that, this conversation about having um, adult conversations about things um, is, is how we've been addressing it. We have one of the poorest communities in the Commonwealth, and steadily for the last 12 years, we raised up to 2.5%. But what the council and the mayors have been doing in the past is that they just shift all that cost onto the, it had to shift all that cost onto the, the business community. So New Balance has a building in our, in our city, and anybody who would have New Balance in their city, they'd be very happy for that. And the guy said, my taxes in the last seven years have gone up, uh, not 100%, but 300%. And so can you explain to me why I would stay here? Uh, and I said, you know, that this is important. We should probably talk about it. So we're starting. So the not raising taxes was less about the homeowners because actually valuations went up. <laughs> so they didn't really feel it. But the valuations for the commercial didn't go up, and they, fe they felt some relief. Um, but it was kind of cool to do because people thought, we, you know, you can't not raise taxes every year. Uh, but the other thing that we did is that we actually shut down some of the services. We had windows that went dark, and we had less services and some other stuff. And every time somebody asked me about it, I'm like, remember how we didn't raise taxes? That's what the result of this thing is. Um, and, and going back to a piece where I started with having the trust to tell people, 
we do have to spend money over here. And if you you notice, we've you know we put all the cops that we could. Another thing that I got from Lisa, all the cops that you could put in, that were inside the police station, put them out on the street. It would increase the number of police officers on the street. She, you know, so we did that, and people were like, oh, that's good. You don't have like seven cops sitting behind a desk doing administration. Um, people say, okay, then if you need more, if you really think you need more money for cops, they trust you to do that. Um, but we. We also don't let, the, like I said, the bullies in the room say, yeah, you guys are just spending like drunken sailors. Um, we just, we fight back on it. But I'm hoping that we have a better adult conversation about revenue. Um, and I t every chance I get to talk to the governor about it, I said, you guys have to pivot on this. The Republican um, mantra about no new taxes is just crazy. IBM says we need to raise revenues, because, and the problem is computing. They're not like, you think we can get seven high school kids in here to build a computer for us? No, they just, they buy the supercomputer and they expect the revenues are going to come in. And I think that's what we should be doing in government. So if you look at some of the recent surveys that Chamber of Commerce have done, um, the tax issue is not very high on the list. There is some concern about workforce costs. There is some concern about now the rising real estate costs. But um, overall, it's not a huge discussion. I think sometimes politicians make the conversation much more worse or much more siloed than it should be. In terms of taxation, I look at, for example, Massachusetts' heavy, heavy reliance on property taxes, but yet I see that the higher the property tax in a community, the more likely the voters are to vote an even higher property tax. It's um, the lower communities, like the Lawrence and the Fitchburgs of the world, for example, where the older urban infrastructure that is decaying has made us um, have a total depreciation in our overall costs because you have your, let's say, you know, it's $2 billion, but then, you know, 10 million of it a year starts to decay because it's all in infrastructure. So the problem is, is that you're spreading the tax burden on more and more people who are not capable of bearing that burden. So my taxes on my house, which is twice the size of my parents' house, two grand. They pay close to eight for, a, 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 you know, half the size. And they're saying that their taxes are going up um, by more than my overall tax burden yet their community is more likely to vote for tax increases than mine. So what is that doing? That's creating income disparities, which has a much greater overall cost impact on society. So these are the kinds of things where I'm hoping that we try to change the conversation to the right thing. So most of my city councilors are on the opposite political spectrum than I am, and we're about to go into budget sessions, so they're gonna talk about you know, lowering taxes, lowering taxes, lowering taxes, but they could reduce taxes to zero, which they can't do, but they could eliminate taxes entirely. That would be about $30 million for the city of Fitchburg. We just saved more than $30 million through a single negotiation with our unions to, to reduce our overall long-term liability costs. So I try to you know, say, here, you know, here's the conversation, you know, here are the big giant pieces of um, you know, economic good that no one talks about, and then here are the little ones that everyone likes to talk about. We always sort of joke as mayors that um, you know, if I ask them for an you know, $18 million wastewater project, it's gonna pass. But if I ask them for you know, $18 to put up a sign at the park, we're gonna be in there for weeks debating it. It's, just, it's such an, it's just, it's an interesting dynamic, but I think it's because people want to get engaged. So I feel like it's our responsibility to try to take those kinds of conversations that people get intimidated about. People don't admit they don't know it. So they're going to say, I'm for taxes again. You know, they're going to sort of oversimplify the conversation and to change the story so that people can kind of understand the value that they're getting. And those communities that are voting for tax overrides, usually it's for schools and usually because they're higher educated and usually because they value education. So this is where, again, we as mayors in the older urban cities, we have to advocate for those who don't have a voice. And in this case, it's usually our school children. And people will tell you at the door when you go door knocking, I don't mind paying for more police. I'm not paying for more firefighters. I'm not for better snow plowing. Absolutely. We just don't trust that you guys are going to do that. Yeah, that's another. Well, just an interesting point on that, too, in terms of sort of placing value on city services. Obviously, the, the more clear connection there is between, between the city service and the, and the way that you're going to pay for it, likely more you know, easier. Um, I know you're still working on the trust issue, it sounds like. Um, but what about when you're talking about things like pensions and health care and costs that you, you, you don't, you're not necessarily going to have that? How do you have that conversation? How do you have that communication? In Fitchburg, we brought everyone to the table. Um, so when we had that conversation, we took all 17 unions and created a uh, public employee committee. 
um, so that we sat at the table and we negotiated for about two years. Um, we had the, we had just you know every kind of conversation possible, um, and in in terms of any information they wanted, you know we were an open book. We were very transparent. So by the end of the day, um, everyone agreed that, for example, reshaping our um, contracts and reshaping our uh, our healthcare plans was the way to go to save jobs and to save money. So, like we saved a ton of money through healthcare, but we redesigned the plan such that everyone's contribution costs are lower, but we also save money for the city. So they they pay less out of their pocket and they get to keep their job. Um, how do you do that specifically? Well, you actually have to change things um, in a very complicated way and have to have those tough conversations. I think sometimes in government we don't. Um, throw open the doors, or we have this kind of assumption that we're automatically going to be on the opposite side of things. You know, we sort of saw that in Wisconsin. If unions feel like you think that they're there to just take money from you, or and they look at you and they think that you're just there to get stuff from them, it really is starting things off on the wrong foot. We just haven't done it yet. <laughs> you know, we're, it feels weird because it does feel like everybody's talking about OPEB, and I just think we just want to keep the lights on for now and, and do the right, the basic core functions. Um, but you know that the whole OPEB push and that liability just goes to show how why they don't trust folks don't trust us. We have been poor stewards of the people's money, and we spent people's retirement money. I know we did that in Lawrence, and we pushed people who we promised. And this, if I was a union leader, I, why would I ever trust you? We, you took, you said to somebody who worked for the city for 40 years, when you got the job after 40 years, we're going to give you this retirement, and now you're backpedaling on it because in the interim, a you didn't put the money aside. Oh, you spent it. Um, so it, it, it's tough because we have been such awful stewards of people's money. Any other questions? All right. I think that uh, that brings us to the end of the panel. And um, I'll probably pass it over to Catherine to actually end the conference here. But, um, but thank you so much. Thank you to uh, Mayors Wong. Uh, and, uh, and Rivera, thank you so much for, uh, for your insights, um, for leadership. Um, and we know that your communities are going on the right path. Um, at least they're, they're starting to get there uh, with the leadership that you've shown. So um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. That was really, it was, a, I think, a terrific note to end on and, uh, and a really fascinating conversation. And a, and a reminder that um, I'm not going to do the, the usual sort of closing remarks and, and tell you what the key takeaways are, because I think we all listen with a different ear. And we have sort of respective priorities. And um, presumably, each of us has our own key takeaways that we'll walk out of the room with. Um, a couple administrative tasks. I just want everyone to be aware that all PowerPoint presentations, videos, um, and ultimately a conference report that's a synthesis of the findings will be available on our website at bu.edu forward slash IOC. Um, so we'll, all of the great content gathered here will live on. Um, I, so I'll just say that, um, you know, as I said, I, it's really gratifying to close with a conversation from two leading mayors who really prove the, our, our terrific evidence of the title of this convening, fiscal leadership and the central role that leadership, in fact, plays in responsible fiscal stewardship of cities. Um, and it's nice, I think, we've tried to balance the conversation of what have been some of the failings of the past and what are some of the opportunities of the future. We had a mayor we interviewed um, a number of months ago, and she said, you know, I feel like we're using 20th century tools for 21st century problems. So we've really tried to stay oriented on what are the new innovations, what are the new opportunities, what are some of the failures of the past and lessons for the future. So I will just thank everyone who has stuck with us throughout. Um, thank you to all of our terrific speakers and moderators. Thank you to Boston University. Thank you to Graham. Thank you to Connor. I don't know what we would do without you. Um, and thank you to so many of you who've, who've been a part of this, both leading up to and over the last two days. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.